most asset prices collapse to levels that you don't want to believe, such as commodities and equities. But what st will stand out will be currencies backed by gold. We come back to BRICS in China and Russia. Monaco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. Today, I have a new guest on, Simon Hunt. He's the owner of simon-hunt.com. He's a strategic advisor and analyst. Uh, he follows global uh, the global economy, uh, geopolitics, and in particular, the copper market. Uh, Simon, uh, thank you for coming on the channel and uh, welcome. Well, thank you for having me. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, Simon, uh, when we spoke last week, when we uh, corresponded, you asked me what I wanted to talk about. And I said, interest rates in the bond market, bricks and gold. And you said, oh, so you want to talk about everything. And um, it's uh, weird because some people say that politics, like uh, one week or a month in politics is a long time. In geopolitics, it seems to be uh, changing as well. And we've seen recently that um, Xi Jinping met with uh, Joe Biden in San Francisco. And all of a sudden, it looks like the U.S.'s best buddies <laughs> with, with China. And I want to start with... Uh, something to do well indirectly to do with copper i i read a tweet uh yesterday from gold telegraph and he said china and the united states have agreed to pursue efforts to triple renewable energy capacity globally by 2030 we're going to need a lot more copper and silver uh we better get mining so my question to you is First, let's cover the uh, implications on mining, but also the geopolitical implication, because uh, we're told that the Chinese are our arch enemies. You know, now uh, we've seen that U.S. Uh, corporate leaders have paid $40,000 each to listen to him. So please uh, tell us, you know, what you think. I think the me <clears throat> excuse me, I think the meeting was tactical, not strategic. I think there were some relatively easy themes to agree on, such as climate change. What does that really mean for China? Is it really going to change what they're doing? I doubt it. Um, they are expanding their green economy, uh, solar capacity, wind capacity, just at the same time they are expanding the uh, nuclear capacity, the uh, hydro capacity, and continuing to build coal fire stations. I mean, they're very clever. They're using the latest uh, techniques. And what does that do? It gets rid of 99 plus percent of emissions. So I don't see any really big change there. I think it's cosmetic, sounds good, it's tactical. Um, I, when you look at, if you go beyond just this particular meeting, what is America continuing to do? Surrounding China with uh, new military agreements, military bases, um, Korea, Japan alliance. So I don't see any big change there. Uh, Australia came and they've they've agreed. Why did they agree? In my view, um, China wants to build up iron ore reserves in case there is going to be some form of war that they are involved in. <laughs> and I know from my contacts that over I guess probably the last four to six months that a government has been sequestering factory floor space from private companies to build specific products for the PLA. What does that tell you? So, um, yeah, it all sounds good and uh, it will help um, 
probably help the Chinese market in the short term and help the American market in the short term. But I don't see any big change. Yeah, and Xi Jinping said that uh, they don't have any uh, goals of being a, basically an empire or... <laughs> Never have been. It's not yeah. in their history. No, and... Uh, he said uh, we 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 would never sell America short, <laughs> but he said we won't sell China short as well. And uh, I guess we could uh, move over to the BRICS there because there seems to be uh, a lot of uh, assumption, and I'm one of those who assume that uh, you know China and the BRICS and then the other countries that are going to join from the first of uh, January is going to be BRICS eleven that uh, they want to find an alternative to to dealing uh in dollars so how so I, I guess this uh this meeting and this meeting i guess in san francisco wasn't even supposed to be uh be you know it wasn't necessarily for xi jinping to meet uh joe biden it was this uh pacific country conference wasn't it so they just used that i, I wonder if uh, Xi Jinping would have gone to the U.S. if they hadn't had that conference. So how, how do you see this impacting BRICS? And how important do you think uh, uh, BRICS are for the de-dollarization? Uh, and then after that, we can look at how it will impact interest rates in the U.S. as well. I think that you you have to go back to how long has BRICS been been a living animal. They have built very quietly and steadily, particularly the new development bank in, in Shanghai, a, a huge civil service um, with specific areas of, of, of focus, uh, such as uh, exchange rates, uh, economies, uh, trade, education, uh, and even sports. They all have their own secretariats who report in to the head of, uh, first of all, the New Development Bank, and secondly, uh, in into the BRICS secretariat. So... This is the de-dollarization is going to be a progressive but um, slow progress. And the first part is setting up the mechanisms to develop trade within BRICS without using the US dollar. <coughs> And you've got some recent examples like the UAE, India, very large trade pact, all done in, in uh, um, dirhams and rupees. Um, I think eventually there will be, and I say eventually, probably two to three years time, uh, there will be a BRICS currency. Um, it won't directly, in my view, be backed by gold, but indirectly because it will be backed by the bonds of BRICS nations, particularly uh, China and Russia. And China has over 50,000 tons of gold. Simon, I, I just wanted to give a shout out uh, to my... Precious Metals uh, Affiliates, uh, Gold Investments here in the UK. They've got some interesting specials right now. Check out the description of this video for details. And also in North America, I'd like to give a shout out to ITM Trading and also Miles Franklin. All the details are below in the description. And also in these turbulent times, I've recently affiliated the channel with the Dirty Man Safe. Uh, those of you who more than ever need to keep your valuables safe, think about the Dirty Man Safe. They're even shipping now to the UK and to Europe. I have a promo code there, Maneco10. You get 10% off the Dirty Man Safe. 
All the details are below in the description as well. So, Simon, let's continue our conversation. Owned about half, in rough numbers, half by the general public in China, institutions and households, and the rest by different ministries within uh, the government. I mean, anecdotally, I know that the PLA has very large stockpile of gold. Um, and if they've got it, the other ministries have some as well. So I, I think it's it's well spread out. And the day will come when China will say, our currency is backed by gold. Just look what the general public own. And I think that's going to be within two to three years. And Russia has well over 12,000 tons of gold. That is held by, I've forgotten the name of the company that sits over the, the, the central bank, Russia's central bank, and it holds the bulk of the gold. I think the Russian central bank's gold holding is what, 1,200 odd tons, something like that. Um, so that that's how I, I see the, the BRIC side going. How will that impact the dollar world? Um, well, look who are who will very soon be members of uh, of BRICS: uh, UAE, Saudi Arabia. Um, what they do with their dollars, I think will be heavily influenced by what will has probably emerged from the summit meeting in Riyadh. Everybody's kept very silent about it. All I can say is the gossip here in Dubai, and I emphasize it's the gossip, it's not fact is that when King Charles and Pope Francis are here for the opening of COP28 on the 1st of December, the UAE is going to announce that it is fully supporting uh, Palestine and the development of a two-nation state. Well, a two-nation state is not going to be agreed by Israel, particularly since October the 7th. Quite the contrary, I think the hidden agenda of um, the Israeli government is to own eventually, step by step, to own all the biblical lands of the Jews. So, that's Palestine, it's part of what is now Jordan, and part of Lebanon. So, uh, I mean, I, I, I think the situation in the Middle East, at the moment, the superpowers, America, China, and Russia, are telling their assets to keep quiet, but the time will come when I think Israel will make a, make a move. Um, I listen to Israeli news channel 124 on a very regular basis. And listening to the retired IDF and uh, Mossad uh, uh, high level officers, um, two things emerge. The first is that our real enemy is Iran. And secondly, that we must never allow what happened on October the 7th to happen again. Therefore, the time is correct, either now or in the next couple of weeks, few weeks, 
for us to take Hezbollah out. To take Hezbollah out is not just Lebanon, it's Syria as well. And even um, last night, Israel was launching a heavier missile attack on areas around Damascus. They've already bombed the two airports in, in uh, Damascus. So they are, I believe, unusable. But if they <clears throat> make a full-out attack on Syria, then you bring in Russia. They have a strategic alliance. You bring Russia in. What about Iran? So I think we're, we're for the time being, no big escalation in the Middle East. But I think sometime next year or early 2025, I think this could become very explosive. Look how big are uh, American assets in the region. You have one aircraft carrier fleet plus America's most sophisticated command and control ship off the Israeli coast. And you have another. Uh, the SS Eisenhower aircraft fleet in the Oman Sea. Is Iran, I know from my friends, is expecting an aerial attack at some stage. They're prepared for it. Um, they have very sophisticated missile system, hypersonic. And their coastline is lined with Chinese and Russian uh, missile systems. But of course, um, the big play will be that if they are attacked, they will shut down the Hormuz Straits to all traffic. And 20% of the world's oil flows through the Hormuz Straits. I know from a friend that actually they've chosen the two super tankers that will be used to be sunk and thus closing the channel. It's interesting that you mentioned Iran, because that's another uh, question I had for you, because uh, over the last 24 hours, I I'm reading here in the FT, it says, Iran told US it did not want Israel-Hamas war to escalate. And uh, yes, and they even said that they didn't know Hamas was going to uh, invade. Uh, yeah, it was a decision Hamas made, apparently, on its own. Yeah. So it seems to me like Iran is trying to, like, even though we hear in the mainstream Western press that, you know, Iran is behind everything and uh, behind Hamas and that uh, they want war, they want to destroy Israel. Uh, so this kind it just looks to me that Iran is trying to say, look, we don't want anything, uh, any uh, any war. But I, I'm not sure that um, you know maybe the neocons are not so keen. And what you you said about Israel, um, I think the Likud party, if you go back, uh, they want something called Greater Israel, which is not just the um, that's Arab, right Arab territory. <clears throat> In, in, you know, in the old Palestine, but also they want to expand to like uh, like Jordan, uh, Syria, even Iran and Saudi Arabia. So maybe you could touch upon that. And what do you think about the Iranians? Are they just playing a game here? No, I think I think uh, um, Iran has been quietly advised by Russia and China keep things quiet um, for the time being. The impression I get, though without knowing, but listening to people who should know, is that the insurgency groups, um, the ex-Iran insurgency groups in Iraq and Syria um, are not really controlled by Iran. They do their own thing. But having said that, um, 
the raids on um, uh, U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria have caused very heavy casualties, which the White House is keeping locked down. Um, I mean, I, I, I am told that if you went to the military hospital in Maryland, you will find the wards getting increasingly filled up with the wounded soldiers coming back from Syria and Iraq. So if that breaks out, what? how does that change things in the White House? Um, I mean, what I think is very interesting is that the deal partly brokered by China and partly with Saudi Arabia giving a dollop of dollars to the Iranian leadership to mend fences and that Iran was present at the summit meeting in Riyadh, just as Erdogan from Turkey was. I think that's a watership moment. Rivalries between the Arab countries are being put aside for the big common cause. Yeah, and back to uh, geopolitics, um, you know, and all this uh, chaos that could be triggered, like the Strait of Hormuz uh, being um, blocked, you know, that would put oil at least up to 150, I would say. And uh, interest rates now, uh, because in the last two weeks, we've seen a relief rally, or I, I would, in my opinion, it's a counter trend rally in the bond markets, i.e. prices have risen and treasuries and gilts and interest rates have come off, especially long term interest rates. Uh, and uh, I personally believe, uh, having worked in the bond markets for over 20 years, that the uh, era of uh, you know, declining interest rates and cheap credit is over. And this is just a correction. But the other day, um, the Bank of England conducted uh, some exercises. Uh, they even have an acronym for it. I think it's SWES uh, for a the possibility of a major uh, crisis in the bond markets, i.e. that yield spike massively over three days. And, and their excuse, uh, their trigger would be uh, they said is geopolitics <laughs> and of course not all the debt that they've uh, printed and uh, borrowed out of thin air so it, it seems to me that uh, the powers that be and i'm just speculating i'm not a fly on the wall at these meetings uh, they're ready for something to happen even worse in the middle east how how do you view that uh, yeah i think you make uh, a very good point um Having had the effective Fed interest rate rising by about seven times in a couple of years, you are bound to have failures, big and small, arising in the undergrowth of the financial system. And as many people say, the real impact of rising rates lies ahead of us, not behind us. I mean, we have, I, I agree with your comment that what we've seen is a relief rally because we've actually got 10-year um, treasuries rising to 5.4% at the end of the year, peaking at 5.7% in the first quarter. And that's bound to uh, cause big pain within the system. So by then, we have uh, virtually all G7 countries in recession, including America. And then you have the problems within the US financial system. Quite likely by then, 
you're going to have the physical impact of the wars over Israel and Ukraine physically starting to impact the financial system. So the Fed is then forced against its best, best wishes to revert back to QE, drop interest rates, and to put their feet hard on the credit uh, pedal. So we then have a collapse in yields. 10-year treasuries probably bottoming, bottoming around 3% by mid-year. And then that's going to be at the bottom because what that what happens then is the dollar starts a very sharp fall inflation magnified by energy prices soaring because of supply disruptions not necessarily almost rates and food prices also soaring <coughs> because of weather patterns particularly the 89 year Glesberg cycle that in the 1930s caused the Dust Bowl decade in the Midwest. So, what does this mean? It means that by the end of 2024 or early 2025, global inflation will be probably 13, 15%. 10 year US treasuries will rise very sharply. We've got them well over 10%, probably closer to 13%. And what does that do to a highly leveraged world? Collapso. And we then have seven odd years of rolling recessions, if not depression. Most asset prices collapse to levels that you don't want to believe, such as commodities and equities. But what st will stand out will be currencies backed by gold. We come back to BRICS in China and Russia and the Middle East. And I assume your forecast there uh, for for what's going to happen the next 18 months to two years is not uh, discounting a major war being triggered in the Middle East because it could be even worse. No, so no. It, 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 it's, I think the tensions will be enough without a global war. Regional war, yes, I can see that. And I think that's quite likely by the end of next year. I see. And, and uh, as for gold, uh, you, you think uh, a lot of the financial assets and even commodities are going to drop in value and even gold could drop in value. But in relative terms, where do you see, for example, the uh, Dow gold ratio? Uh, I don't follow the Dow gold ratio, so I can't answer the question. <laughs> that's fine. But let's say... but but but. I mean, I by 26, 27, you're going to see the Dow, well, all equity markets at a fraction of today's levels. And where's gold? Gold in dollar terms? Who, who knows? I mean, We've got gold probably 2,500 to 3,000 uh, by the end of 2024. Yeah, I mean, we're well, looking beyond that. I mean, the big question, the, big, the bigger question is in what currencies will commodities be traded? It ain't going to be dollars. I mean, by 2030, I think it is quite possible that BRICS will be joined 
by many of the commodity producing countries in Africa and South America. They don't want dollars. I mean, if you look at what, what a $1980 today is worth, what was it, 25 cents. So all their profits that they have received in dollar terms have been illusionary. Yeah, that's right. And um, I, I think Europe uh, and uh, the US and all the Western countries have a lot to lose. Uh, and do you think that's why we're seeing so many uh, sovereign buyers of gold, especially uh, non-Western, like uh, Russia, China, even Singapore has been buying a, a lot of gold because they know what's coming? Oh, I think so. I think that China and Russia have known it's been this is this crisis has been coming for, for some years. I think it's uh, China in particular. Um, many of their financial experts have been warning the leadership about the coming crisis, and I think been quietly preparing for it. It's why you're not getting, despite the weakness of the economy, you're not getting big credit infusions. They want, they've got, they've got the assets to work through the debt issues that the country currently has, particularly the local debts. And on real estate, I think the policy, not immediately, but over a, a few years, is to allow the private sector developers to go into bankruptcy. And what does, what does Beijing do? They bail out the homeowners. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, the one thing I was thinking is that the scenario we're describing is like a deflationary collapse of asset prices, especially stocks, bonds, and even commodities. But but then, uh, like all the basic necessities, especially for us in the West, they will be really expensive. So it's the, like the the worst of both worlds. Yeah, quite right because our currencies are going to buy very little, it seems. Yeah. I mean, I have a friend uh, who's in Zambia at the moment, knows that part of the world very well indeed. He actually lives here in Dubai. And I was talking to him the other day, and he said, the general public, the kwacha, is not money. They barter. And how, you learn something, um, you barter with food or, or, or some physical asset. So, because I've been a believer that um, commodities are going to do very well in the next, you know, from 2020 to 2030. So, but from what you tell me, you don't think that's going to happen. Uh, no, I think there's, I think that there's going to be a... 12 to 18 month boom in all commodities because of a falling dollar, uh, rising inflation. Um, so we were, and, and that would also mean that once you've had what we've got is a big correction in equities by the middle of next year, um, you then will see a doubling in prices. But it's what happens after that. So what, be, uh, what, what, is, what we're seeing is is a short term cycle, and I keep saying to people, remember what happened between the summer of nineteen seventy nine and the summer of nineteen eighty. Copper rose by seventy five percent, and even gold, uh, I think, uh, went for from four hundred in November of seventy nine to almost 900 in January. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so and same, you see, yeah, same. everything crashing after what? 20, and then it crashed. 26, 27 or? 
what year? 81, it crashed. Yeah, but what about now in the, these next few years? You see a inflationary blow up? <coughs> and then when, when we come <coughs> down, you think? <coughs> Excuse me. We see an inflationary takeoff second half of next year to sometime in the first half of, of uh, 2025. After that, it's collapse. Great. It, it, that's really interesting. And uh, I'd like to thank you for coming on the channel and uh, let me know anytime you've got something interesting that you want to talk to people about. You're more than welcome to come back. And uh, yeah, um, thank you again. So if anybody wants to get hold of me, it's simon-hunt.com. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's Simon's website. And I see that you started out in uh, Rhodesia, northern Rhodesia. <laughs> I, I remember I bought some stocks in the early 90s. One stock in the early 90s was called Lonro. And I think Tiny Roland. That's right. Oh. Yeah, you've got a good memory. Yeah. So well, my years were before that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. Simon uh hyphen hunt dot com if you want to get in touch with Simon or if you wanna like uh yeah, do you have like a subscription service? Yeah. If they get onto that website, it it, it gives you the link to the subscription yeah. service. Just another question I forgot. Uh, you, you see the 10-year yield up to 5.4 by the end of the year. That's interesting because right now it's dipped to like 4.4. So you're yeah, seeing... I know, I know. Yeah. yeah. But as you as you started by saying, what we're seeing is a relief yeah, rally. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, this, I think 4.33. That was the high earlier this year and last year. I think we're just going to retest there, and then it's going to rebound. Correct. Great, Simon. Thanks again, and uh, have a great weekend. Well, thank thank you for having me. You're welcome. And you too. Thank you.